Let's talk to the Emojitrons of Emoji Land and see what the Emoji Tombola is going to offer us today. All right, here we go. Okay. And it's oh, Inspired Phew. Emoji. <laughs> there we go, Inspired Emoji. How do you feel, Chara or Shara, about getting an Inspired Emoji for the Bible Never Said That podcast? Oh. Well, I am I am relieved. Um, <laughs> inspiration is something that I I highly prize um, from God and for people, and I'm just really relieved it wasn't blasphemous because I try really hard to avoid that. <laughs> <laughs> That's so good. Okay, so uh, I mean, when it comes to misconception of the Bible, and even in one of my episodes, I had um, I was interviewing a pastor, and I told him, "Okay, tell me something blasphemous." And he actually said, well, that's easy for me because right now we're going through a series in, in our church called, it, almost like the Bible never said that, but his was, God never said that. And mm -hmm. that's the series that we're in. So it's like, you know, uh, I, I don't remember the, the specific one he used, but it's like, God never said that. And then he attributed that. It was like, that's my blasphemous emoji, right? So there's yeah. a lot of these misconceptions that are, <laughs> I mean, when I, when I think of blasphemous, it's really, in this case, it's probably like a lie. So, yeah. as you have been hosting this show for a while now, and you know, I think you're in like your 40th episode or something like that. Almost right? there, yeah. Yeah, almost there. So, almost like me, I'm on my 40th. I think this is 46. So that's exciting. Nice. Um, so tell me about a little bit of the what the podcast itself is about. The Bible never said that. Like, how do you come up with, with, with the misconceptions or the lies or the phrases that are going to be featured throughout the episodes? Sure. Well, it's not me trying to argue with culture and tell culture mm. you're so wrong. You're so bad. And we should remove ourselves from the world because I don't believe that's what Jesus teaches. I think we should interact with the world in a discerning and biblical way. And so my goal is to help people find, um, find truth, not to find a way to shut up some well-meaning friend that maybe said this little cliche or saying to them, um, cause that is not kind, but instead explore with my listeners, the ways that holding to wrong beliefs kind of distorts truths and that it can lead us down really destructive roads. If we don't get a hold of it as a biblical counselor, I've seen far too many people believe little lies that grew into foundational beliefs based on these falsehoods and it cracked, you know, their foundation cracked at some point. And they lit, I mean, I lived with a messed up foundation for years myself. And most of the stuff I built it upon didn't stand the test of time as where God's word always will. Mm, okay. So oh, there's a lot there. So when you say, mm -hmm. um, you grew up with a few misconceptions, what are some of those? I mean, I, I want, it's just so good because no, misconceptions can lead to even dangerous beliefs, almost like what you're saying. Um, mm -hmm. So tell me a little bit about how did you grow up in relationship to maybe some of these misconceptions? So I didn't really get into the scriptures until I was in my 20s. But I knew that there was Jesus and I knew that he loved me and I knew he died for my sins. And so I was like, well, he died for my sins. And so he'll forgive me. And I kind of just lived as my own God instead of really looking to what God has to say. And I developed God kind of the concept of God into this God of my own making that I thought, Oh, well, he would understand, or these ideas are old fashioned. And so God, God will understand my sin because he, he sees my heart. And so it was really me being my God and making God in my image, which was really damaging because then when my life kind of crashed apart, because I was following a bunch of things that I thought would make me happy when those went away or they kind of just fell away, my life felt completely unstable. And it was only when I found something that would stand the test of time and be true always. And the true God for who he says he is, instead of who I wanted to make him, that I found a foundation I could stand on. Okay, so so do you have some episodes that are called like the half truth episodes? Yes. And I mean that that to me is like wow, I want to talk a little bit about those because sure. um and then you also said something like 
when when you believe enough of the half truth, it it kind of evolves into a a truth. It's a misconception, but it's like your reality that's truth. So, mm -hmm. what are some of the like the typical misconceptions or half truths that you think people are are going through or culture, you know, even going through right now? Sure, when um, it relates to the, the Bible. Half Yeah, the half truth ones. Um, the one that I think people responded to the most when I did this series was do not judge because the Bible absolutely says, um, you know, there's, there's those verses that talk about do not judge, but then Jesus says, but judge rightly, right? So don't judge as you will be judged all of that. And, um, I don't have the scriptures right here in front of me to reference, but they, he does say judge rightly. So we sometimes pull that one out and we use that and tell, and so that the culture can't tell us what that we should be living as God would, and that we shouldn't judge and that we shouldn't call anything sin. Now, I do think that the, the barriers are different for unbelievers versus believers. Right? A believer, you should call out sin. An unbeliever, you should get to their heart and help them to understand Jesus because then they'll see their sin themselves because people without the Holy Spirit can't always see the, the damage that they're doing to themselves and the actions that they're taking. But once you're a believer, you should call out sin in other people. And so it's, it's a judging rightly. Um, instead of not, not to judge anything, because we have to make judgments throughout our days, but it is not to judge under your own ideas of what is right, but to judge rightly from God's perspective of what he says is right. Mm. Well, that's so good. So um, I know there's a lot of almost like people who debate uh, even like the inerrancy of the Bible. I think that's, that's yeah. kind of like a... a a new thing, or I don't know if it's new, but it's it's pretty prominent, I would say, in our culture and in our era. And yeah. uh, this is something I kind of learned when I was growing up, and I've been going to church all my life, which is about 40 years. And, you know, in many different backgrounds of churches, you no know, Pentecostal, traditional, whatnot. Mm -hmm. And I remember in one of them, uh, our pastor back in Mexico, right? He was saying... Just imagine somebody building whatever, no, a wall, a wall with bricks. And mm -hmm. there's this thing called, I, I guess, it's, yeah, in English, it would be the plumb line. In Spanish, it's la plomada. So okay. it was literally like a, a string that's hanging from, <laughs> uh, from one side to the other so that you could have your wall straight, right? So when you're putting the bricks and you end up on the other side of the string, the wall actually looks like a... Like a, I mean, unless you want to make like, you no, know, a crooked yeah. uh, wall for for a purpose, right? But in this case, I mean, if you want to make a straight wall, you need some kind of guidance and direction. It's like that is the plumb line. That is that is yes. what builders use. And he was saying that is kind of like what the Bible is, right? It's almost mm -hmm. like a plumb line, like a guidance. How do you interpret the Bible in in that sense? Do you see that? Like, is that? ring a, a bell for you like yeah that's true or kind of yeah i absolutely think that like that's what keeps us straight you know um i have a pastor who often uses the illustration of if you're sailing and if you're sailing to somewhere across the ocean if you get off one degree you're going to end up in a completely different country right mm -hmm. so you have to always have that pointing to a true north. And I absolutely believe God's word to be the true north of my life. And, and that if I have it pointed at him and am doing my best to live in accordance with what he teaches, um, then I'm in good shape. Because like 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So he is the one who equips me for good work, but I have to believe that he is the one who inspired the word. And, and that is my belief that he really did and that he gave us the Bible so that we could know him because we will not trust a God that we do not know. So he gave us the scriptures so we could know his heart and know his truth. Mm, that's so good. So, Let's say, let's just be a little skeptical right now sure. and maybe yep. even, you know, 
pretty much when I think of skeptical, is it's actually kind of like giving the benefit of the doubt to people yeah. or even like playing devil's advocate, right? That's what it means okay. in my in my head. Um, so if is there any other way to know God besides like if we wouldn't have scriptures, can we know God or is this like the ultimate way from your vantage point? <laughs> Okay, so I absolutely believe that scripture is the best way to know God. But if people do not have scripture available to them, I also believe that God will reach them in some way and somehow. The scriptures tell us that creation cries out the truth about God. It also tells us that um, he, you know, we, we look at Paul the apostle, and he didn't have, he had the Old Testament, but he didn't have the New Testament, right? Or we look at Moses, who was given the Old Testament law, and God reached out to Moses, and God reached out to Abraham, who had nothing to know God by at that point. And so when people do not have scripture available to them, I believe that God will reach them in the ways that he knows he needs to. We hear stories often from um, people about how God spoke to them in their dreams. Now, I do think those should be weighed with discernment, but when, especially in countries where they don't have the scriptures available to them, I, I totally believe that he will reach them and by whatever uh, means possible because he loves his people. Now, for those who get to have the scriptures in their possession and um, are able to read them daily without persecution, without harm, we should be grateful people because we hold something precious in our hands. Wow. So in that, in, in light of that, even, wow, that's so profound right there because uh, I feel like Western civilization, right? I'm just gonna say America, because I'm here, right? Okay. So I'll say in America, um, I guess there's so much freedom, right? Or, well, that's, let's just assume there, we're still in the era of freedom before, yes. you know, speeches, whatever. Uh, <laughs> we're still in the era of freedom. And maybe a little bit of that has caused people to, um, like you you are so free that when you think of the Bible, it's like, well, it, you're even so free to reject it like so blatantly when in other countries, it's like, wow, this is like the source of all my hope is in, it's in, getting the scriptures right so yeah. tell me a little bit about like how do you feel um this relationship of of freedom with with the scriptures with with acknowledging like this is this is the word almost like i guess the question is diminishing the value of scripture because it's so available right well, absolutely. I mean, how many voices can we listen to each day? How many things can we read? How much can we find? And here's the Bible, still the bestseller, right? You know, it's wow. still yeah. still the 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 bestseller, but there's so many um, perspectives available, things like that. And uh, people have, they don't know how to do the research anymore, but uh, that's, sorry, that's the professor and me coming out. But, <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Um, I think that, when we are living in a culture that has a rotating meaning of truth um, or says you can look within yourself to find truth, uh, it is because we have lived with great freedom, but it may not be the deep freedom that Christ desires for us. You know, I learned early on because I really, um, like I said, I wanted to define my own life. I wanted to uh, live by my own rules and until they failed me and broke up in my, or like broke up my whole life in my face. Like it, it didn't become something that I looked to, to look outside of myself for truth, but the Bible's always there constant. And uh, in America, now I'm going to use the word vaccine, but I'm not talking about the vaccines that we're talking about everywhere else. But I think it was Billy Graham who said that in America, it's like we got a flu. It's like we got the flu shot, like a, like a vaccinated dose of Jesus. And um, because we got this, this little bit of Jesus, so many people have known his name, but they never know the true thing. Like it's just, just enough that they know who he is, but they don't know him. And that always made a lot of sense to me living in America and, and kind of seeing, um, the way that we take freedom, uh, for granted, because when I've traveled to places, I, I traveled to China at one point and we were teaching English there and sharing the gospel with people and they could not 
have the freedom that we have. And that is what really grew my appreciation for me. Like, okay, here, I hold the word of God in my hands. I have access to it all the time. I could go out on the street and preach if I want to, and nobody's going to come arrest me or take me because here is this man that I want everybody to know about that I love so much and that loves us and can set the captives free. Um, So I think that we have a, we don't understand freedom really as we should. Uh, and because of that, we don't look for true freedom. There's so many people who in their freedom put themselves into captivity with various different things, whether it be Netflix or drugs or alcohol. Mm, Wow. So we put ourselves into captivity. Oof. That's, I mean, that's strong right there. So true. So well, tell me, tell me a little bit about that experience in China, because uh, like I, we've seen like even videos, right, where you know, let's say we go to a retreat and they're talking about uh, you know, bringing Bibles to China. And well, I don't know if you've ever experienced that, where they put a video of like people receiving like the Bibles in their hands. And they're I mean, there's it's like a party, right? Like, wow, it's here. It's right here. And uh, well, there's a, a bunch of other questions I'm thinking as I'm thinking about smuggling uh, mm-hmm. Bibles into China, you know, and the ethical aspects of it and whatnot. But I mean, that's regardless. Uh, just the, the the reaction of getting the Bible in their hands. Like, tell me a little bit about that experience. A, a little more of um of the the necessity for the Word of God that you have experienced in people in China. Oh sure. So I will say it was a while ago. Um, and so the rules are a little bit stricter now from what I understand. Oh, stricter. Uh, and so, yeah, we wow. could take, yeah, I was, it was early two thousands when I went, but it was, it was a life changing experience for me because I really did see how much I took my freedom, um, for granted. So we could take our Bibles with us and stuff like that, but we had to be very careful not to, uh, speak certain words like God or Jesus or even Bible, you know, out when we were out in public, we had to use like kind of code name type things for those things. Um, But I think it's that there's, there's not when people, sorry, when people hope they become powerful and passionate and uh, for a controlling country, they become a little bit dangerous because they have found something to live their lives for. And when you live your life for something passionately, you come truly alive and you experience that true freedom. So the people who have the word in, in China and they're willing to die for their faith, those are people who are truly free, even though they're living under a lot of oppression. Do you think, do you think that's coming to America Um, or my, my hope is we're going to be okay, but you know, (laughs) just what, what do you, not, what do you hope yet? What do you think is going to happen? So I think that if we look in the scriptures, we see that at some point, uh, everybody will be told not to talk about Jesus. I don't think we're there yet, but of course we're closer to it than we've ever been because we don't know exactly when that's going to be. However, with the restriction stuff we were dealing with in America, that's not my main concern about what's going on. I think that there are there are still plenty of freedoms that we have here. And I I think that I understand that because I have traveled other places. You know, for me, I kind of felt like, okay, America's acting a little bit like a spoiled teenager in regards to a lot of things like, Hey, don't, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. Um, And why I do believe we should continue to have freedom. We are a free country. We're a democracy, things like that. Uh, I don't think that we're in danger of necessarily having our faith suppressed quite yet. But I do think there is a day where it will come because I I see that in the scriptures that there will be a time where those who profess to know Jesus will be persecuted. And Jesus never hid that. It is going to happen at some Mm -hmm. point. I I don't think we're there yet. I think that we, um, things will get a lot worse before that. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) Yeah. Which isn't, which is very happy, but I'm like, I, I think that too, in, in America, um, we're giving it up ourselves. 
You know, we don't want anybody telling us what to do. And even if that's God, we, a lot of us want to be our own God. And so a lot of Americans are saying, Hey, just get it out and don't, uh, we, we don't care what God says. And so they're, they're eliminating that as something that people can talk about already themselves as a major, uh, like a huge part of the population that's saying, don't talk to me about your faith. Um, it's not necessarily government, but there's the social pressure that's saying Christians can't tell me what I'm doing is wrong and they can't call anything sin. And that, that is probably more pressure than I think we were receiving from the government. Mm, wow. So misconceptions about the Bible. I'm thinking uh, one of the things you were saying at the beginning was the idea of judgment and how people perceive that as, um, you know, like the Bible as judgmental. And even the dichotomy of, yes, the Bibles tell us to do it, but, but at the same time, it tells us to be loving. So here's an idea that might be suitable for uh, the Bible never said that episode. Okay. And let's see, let's see what you think of it. So it's a phrase that I've heard lately and it's called okay. love is love. And mm. the Bible says <laughs> that God is love. So yes. uh, how do you relate like the, the phrase love is love with God is love? Sure. Well, I, first of all, when I hear that love is love, you're right. Maybe I should do that because I do have thoughts on it. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh When I hear love is love, it reminds me that in our culture, we have been built upon the foundation of the Bible and of the God of love. Okay. That, that stems from a distorted view of the Christian God. So again, if we're looking worldwide, there's a lot of cultures that don't understand the Christian God and the Christian God is, is who a lot of our principles were based upon. And so, yes, God is love. All of who he is, is love. So we can't just take one attribute and think that we can define it and say, well, God is love as I define love. No, God is love as he defines love. So we have to look at the rest of his character. We have to look at the parts where says God is just, there is justice. You know, uh, we have to look at the parts that God is mercy. He's full of grace um, that God does get angry at harm happening to his people and sin is harm happening to his people. So we call out sin because it's harm happening to God's people. And, and in that, as long as we do it from a motivation of wanting people to be free and wanting people to know Jesus and not wanting them to be hurt anymore, instead of trying to control, which I think sometimes people um, use God's name to try and control others, which I absolutely believe is wrong. But if we're, we're coming from love and we're saying, okay, well, the culture says love is love, but they're still coming from a standpoint of They, they believe that love is merciful and grace uh, full of grace. It's because they drew those attributes from the foundation of a country that's based on the Christian God. And so it's a distortion. And I think that's what the devil does all the time. He just wants, the enemy wants to distort things. He wants to distort and get us away from the truth a little bits at a time. So we end up somewhere else. And just like we talked about earlier, I think that's where we are when you have love is love is that we, we just as a, as a nation or as Western culture in general, because I believe this is over in, in Europe as well of, of love is love. It's, it's just a slight distortion of a deeper truth. And the devil just is pulling away the truth a little bit at a time, but yeah, God is love, but love is he defines love, not love as we've decided we're going to define it. Wow. So good. So can truth like is truth one And is truth complete? Like when you when you think of the half truths, mm -hmm. is a half truth essentially a lie, or can there ever be an incomplete truth? So I do believe that none of us, not one person walking the the planet right now, has a complete understanding of scripture. Right. We're going to get things wrong. Even the people who are like, I've studied it and I know and I know all these things, they're going to get things wrong. I'm going to get things wrong, which is why I was glad I didn't get the blasphemous emoji. Right. You know, I, I, know I can offer it to you anytime. 
please don't. <laughs> I'll try to stay away from it. Um, but I, I mean, we're, we're all trying to do our best, but we are humans and God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts. So um, in that, everybody's going to get something wrong. We're going to have incomplete understandings of truth. You know, there, so we're all, you know, those of us who, who love Jesus, we're going to get to heaven. We're going to be like, I, yeah, I was really wrong about that. Oops. You know, um, and, and we just have to try not to hurt too many people in the process is always kind of like what I want to do that, that for me, I, that's a fear I have to fight against in doing ministry for Mm. the kingdom of God is I don't want to hurt people. I don't want to be somebody's church wound. I don't want to say that one thing to them. That's like, Oh no, I don't, I don't talk to church people or I don't talk to people who read the Bible because that hurt them so bad. Um, I want to be somebody who is always speaking the truth in love so that hurt hearts can find healing. Wow. Hurt hearts can find healing. That's so good. And when you said speaking the truth in love, um, I think it was Paul maybe writing that. Some guy in the New Testament (laughs) uh, writing about speaking the truth in love. And this is, this is, I love that phrase because I almost feel like speaking the truth in love is more truth than even the truth by itself, right? Mm -hmm. Because the truth by itself, I think that's when it can feel judgmental. And I feel like maybe that's not even truth because um, you could be saying the same thing, you know, like the the great example is, (laughs) I know my pastor uses it all the time, like, I'm not yelling, right? And yeah. you're yelling and you're screaming and uh, you might be. So the truth. Okay. I lost my train of thought right there. That's good. But um, what was I saying? <laughs> I think you were talking about the, the motivations of our heart. Yes, were... exactly. Exactly. You got it. Motivations of our heart. So uh, can you elaborate a little bit about uh, on that? Like, Do you think ultimately the Bible is trying to point us to the, well, I'm I'm putting words in your mouth, but what what would you say? I guess I don't want to say it because now I feel like I've I've almost like jinxed the question. Um, Let's just finish your thought that you were saying about the motivation of the heart. (laughs) Okay. Well, sure. I mean, well, even with your yelling example, right? Hmm. The way we communicate things matters. Our communication as Christians, uh, the for those who are Christians, should be redemptive in its purpose. So we should not be trying to destroy. We should always be trying to redeem and take back what the enemy has stolen. And when we are speaking the truth and love to somebody, it's because we are trying to break through the lies that they've built around their heart or their life or their soul and help them to get rid of anything that's hurting them, right? Get it, get rid of anything that's keeping them from seeing clearly because, you know, the enemy wants us to not be able to see the truth of God. And the scriptures tell us in first Samuel, you know, that God doesn't look at the outward man. He looks at the in, in, inwardness of our heart. So if we are trying to share Jesus with other people, our motivations should be because we want them to know Jesus. And if our motivations are anything else, you know, we want them to find healing. We want them to find freedom. If they're anything else, if they're anything to do with control or power, guess what? We are going to be responsible for that before God, because he is the one who is in control. He is the one who has the power. And if we are trying to manipulate others with the scriptures, you're we'll be in trouble. Like people who, who use the scriptures in that way are going to have to, to pay for it. We all face judgment. And, um, but it, that matters. And I think people can see that too. They know when we're trying to control them, um, or when we are trying to love them. And honestly, some people come not from control and not from love, but they come from fear. They're scared that the world is looking differently than they want it to. And so they try to make everybody believe the same as they do out of fear and I think that that is distorted as well because it really should be out of love. Wow. That's so intense. I I was talking <laughs> to a couple of Jewish um, scholars. Uh, yeah. It was almost like a year ago, I think, on one of the shows. 
And anyways, one of them was saying, wow, the Bible has been used to cause a a lot of harm to many people, you know, and she as a Jewish, she was even saying, you know, when I was a little kid, people would, people used to blame me for killing Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. So, because she was a Jew and, and people had the misconception that Jewish people ended up killing Jesus, right? When, right. I mean, if you really dig into it, Jesus offered his life and, and I mean, there's, we could get theological on it, but yeah. Uh, I guess some of these misconceptions can cause a lot of harm to people. So yeah. when you say, I don't want to hurt people and I don't want to manipulate people, what are some of the ways, what are some of the ways you think the Bible could be manipulated? Like, is there a, is there a, an idea or a thought that's coming to your mind? Like, I, I feel like I've seen it, I've witnessed it in this way. And then maybe yeah. let's w talk on the antidote to that too. Well, we can always, you know, you look back at history, you have the crusades, you have people fighting for certain things. I mean, even, even in popular culture right now, like the, no the novels, um, the handmaid's tale that I think it's Margaret Atwood that wrote them all. It's the Bible being used completely wrong and right. And there's a TV show and stuff of it too. It's become very uh, popular in culture because um, people are, you know, it's, it's interesting. It's a dystopian, it's a whole messed up society, but the craziness is that the messed up society is based off of this passage in Genesis where, um, Jacob gives his handmaids or, uh, Rachel gives her, I say Rachel. Yeah. Rachel gives her handmaid to Jacob so that they can have a baby because she says, if I don't have children, we'll die. That's what that whole novel and that TV show is based off of. Right. It's, it's because it can be very dangerous. And I mean, it's an imaginative thing, but it's not far from how people twist the Bible. If they want to build their own society off of something, you can take passages of scripture out of context. Um, and you take, you rip them out of context and you can use them to manipulate and kind of try to say whatever you want. Yeah, there's a lot, the Bible has a lot of words, right? <laughs> so you take any of them out, you yeah. can, you can make them say something that you want them to say. But again, is that what God inspired them to say is a bigger question, right? Mm. You know, Handmaid's Tale is fictional. God would be really upset about all of the stuff that goes on there. That's kind of crazy, but, and I'm not suggesting it as a reading material or <laughs> a viewing material, but I am saying it's, it, it's a whole series built off of the people have grabbed onto built off of a mis misconception of scripture and a ripped out passage. Um, it's, it's very dangerous for us to just take, take words out of scripture and say, this is what it means without looking at in context. Mm -hmm. Wow. So here's, here's the, the question I had before. As I'm trying to like put all the dots together, yeah. what would be even even to the idea at the beginning when I said, if we don't have the Bible, do you think still God can speak to people? Mm -hmm. And you were you know, elaborating on that. So what would you say is the ultimate goal of, of Scripture, of the Bible? Sure. Again, I think it's to know God. And to, and it points us, all of it points us at Jesus. So there's this over, they, they, there's this fancy word, just the meta narrative, which means the big story. What's the big story? Mm. And that's what you're asking is, is there's creation, there's fall, there's redemption, and then there's restoration, right? So, so that's the basics of the Bible. But I also think that the point of it is so that we can know God. I think beyond that, those things are important. Yes, creation is important. Yes, knowing and understanding the fall helps us see our need for a savior. And then there's redemption when Jesus comes. And then there's going to be restoration when Jesus makes all things right. That there will be a day where no more sorrow and no more pain. Um, and he is ruling over all people once again and every knee will bow. But really the scriptures are there so we can know Jesus. All of scripture points at him. And he wants us to know him and be known by him. And he is the one that changes us. I mean, the Bible, I love the Bible, obviously, but I love Jesus more, right? It's, mm. it's not the Bible that I worship. It's Jesus. Wow. Say that again. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the Bible that I worship. It's Jesus. Wow. That's oof. That's amazing right there. And the, the funny thing is, I, well, I don't know if, what whatever some people would even say wow that's kind of blasphemous right but to me it makes total sense you know that the bible points to jesus it's almost like 
you can't have one without the other. But yeah, right? yeah, say I, I think that that's kind of true. Um, I think it is J.R.I. Packer who said, let me see, I know this quote. It's like what what scripture says, God says. Right. So we know we understand that the scriptures are supposed to be inspired by God, um, but for in a manner comparable only to the deeper mystery of the incarnation, which means um, that Jesus is both God and human, right? Is the Bible is both fully it's, it's written by humans, but it's divine, you know, it, it's inspired. And so that's J.R. J.I. Packer said something along those lines, right? My, my, my brief paraphrase, but um, that the Bible is there for us to know God. So good. Inspired. That's why we had a emoji reaction for the inspired. So, uh, Shara, this is, I mean, thank you so much for being on the show. This has been great. Now, this is your chance to go from blasphemous to divine. Okay, so what okay. we're going to do is we're going to walk through the five emoji reactions and you're going to come up with an idea that has to do with each of them. Okay. So we start with blasphemous and the question is, uh, Shara, when it comes to the Bible and the misconceptions about it, what would be the most blasphemous idea? Um, it's full of error and written by humans alone. Oh, that's so good. Wow. Okay. Love it. Um, let's move on to skeptical. Okay. What would be the the idea that either you find you're skeptical of or that you think it's the most skeptical idea? Like in general? Yes. Oh. About the Bible. About the Bible. Okay. Um, that it is fallible. Uh, because it was written by humans. Oh, ah. yeah. So we're we're kind of like if we follow that yeah. train of thought, that makes sense, right? If yeah, yeah. If the Bible is inerrant, then it's fallible. I mean, if it's errant or whatever, right? So yeah. okay. Uh, inspired. Where do you use? How would you react with an inspired emoji when it comes to the Bible? Um. Let's see. That. It is inspired by God, but we don't know if it's every little part of it is true. Like, I don't know. That kind of gets a blasphemous to me. <laughs> so it's going to be, it's going to be hard for me to separate inspired, holy and divine because I, you know, it's, but I, I think if we're going on a spectrum there, that there's a lot of people who are like, yes, I believe it's inspired by God, but I don't necessarily think every bit of it is true. Oh, okay. That makes but sense. I do. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's so good. Okay. Yeah, so you're giving people the benefit of the doubt, pretty much. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, so let's move on to holy. Um, what is holy when it comes to the Bible or holy that idea? It, that it is inspired and uh, without error. Okay. Wow. So you're moving on the spectrum, really, from <laughs> blasphemous to that's so good. Okay. Uh, and then finally, divine. What is the most divine idea when it comes to the Bible? So I think it's that it is inspired by God. It is without error. And I live my life according to it. Ooh. All right, my friends, we're having a party right here with our emoji reactions. But what is your reaction? If you guys, you know, want to give us the benefit of the doubt, uh, what would be your emoji reaction? I hope you guys would send us your comments and thoughts. You can visit christianpodcast.com to find out more about our episodes, to check out our emoji and our merch. But Shara, uh, where do you want to point people to to find more about you know, your podcast or the work that you're doing? Sure. Uh, my podcast, you can find on Life Audio at The Bible Never Said That, but it's also on iTunes and Spotify and anywhere you find your stuff. I'm about to do an out-of-context series 
uh, is coming up where I'm taking verses that we use and we use them out of context and how dangerous that is. Ooh, and so good. Um, I also have a website that's charadonahue.com where you can just kind of find my articles and links to my podcast, stuff like that. So good. Can you tease like one of the ideas of the <laughs> of this new uh, out of context that you're going to do? Sure. Um, how about, uh, the Jeremiah 29, 11, you know, that, that God has a future and a hope. So God absolutely has a future and a hope for the, his people, but we rip that one out of context and use it and promise, uh, to promise things that the word necessarily doesn't. Oh, uh oh, and that would be blasphemous right there. Chara, thank you so much for being on the show and I hope Thanks to see you soon. Me. Great. Thank you. Thank you.